What does it mean to regenerate? The re-emergence of the concept of regeneration in our culture is a hot topic. From producers to products, legislation to certifications, celebrities to students, there's no shortage of passionate perspectives. Welcome to Regen Circle. I'm Paige Fay, and on this show, we're here to explore the re-emergence of regenerative concepts and practices and their impact on ecosystems and culture. If you like what you hear, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Welcome to The Circle. Hey everyone, I'm Paige Fay with Regen Circle and I'm here with Ron Johnson today. And Ron, after a very long career doing everything from production of video games to brine shrimp fishing, has become the steward of several amazing ranches here in Boulder, Utah, next to Capitol Reef National Park. And we're here today to talk about his work in this world. Thank you, Ron, for having me. It's an honor to, to be here with you and to think that I have enough interesting things to say to, you know, uh, include me in your project. I'd love to, to start out by talking about this place and where we are and, and what drew you to this place. We're on the Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch. This is a, a one of five homesteaded, 160 acre uh, homesteaded pieces of property in a little uh, valley here called Salt Gulch which is just uh, about seven miles south and west of um, Boulder, Utah. So this area, as you mentioned, is next to Capitol Reef um, to the east and Bryce Canyon National Park to the west, nestled in a really unique geological area. Um, uh, this mountain up here, we can't appreciate and see the top of it. It's actually a plateau, a high forested plateau, the highest forested plateau in the world, I'm told. Um, at about 11,300 feet, and it drops very quickly uh, down to 4,000 feet in about 15 miles as the crow flies through five of the world's life zones and uh, 11 of the world's 16 climate zones with uncountable microclimate zones. Um, and that's why it was called the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument when Clinton and Gore in the last week of their administration protected this 1.9 million acre park, primarily for the science. It's rich in paleontology, geology, earth science. A lot of the department heads in the, in the Grand Staircase are the world's greatest in their fields. And they're here really to unravel the science to find out the history of, of this planet, the anthropology in the area, but also to utilize that to kind of get a glimpse to where we're going. What brought me to this area was the exploration and excitement of you know being able to be free and into early adulthood at 16 when I got my driver's license. My friend and I, we, we turned 16 around the same time. We were kind of um, becoming self-taught fly fishermen at that time and some of the fly shops and the older guys we were talking to uh, must have had some sort of intuition that this place was for us but they told us there was this secret, no, uh, secret unknown spot in, uh, in outside a little town of Boulder, where there were fish down deep in these canyons, in these slot canyons that had never seen human beings, and that these, this area was alpine and desert, all connected with water. So we came down here. I'll never forget it. I rode over the mount, drove over the mountain during the fall. The colors were out. It was just breathtaking, literally. And then coming around these ridge lines and looking off into the horizon, 300 or more miles into the painted desert. And I just really had come to the conclusion that I hadn't ever seen anything quite that beautiful. Mm. We dropped down into the canyons. We got lost for a few days and uh, not really. We knew we either had to go up or down for the most part, but we were, we were lost in the beauty of it all and lost in the experience. So that had a profound effect. And I kept coming back to the staircase. Well, it wasn't the staircase until 96. I came in here in 78 just exploring all these canyons, exploring the mountain, the alpine, the desert, the slots, um, finding petroglyphs, not knowing if anyone had ever seen them, thinking maybe we were the first ones. It was just, um, it was just became my place, you know, became the place where I could go to think. We started working with early experiences with psilocybin as we were coming out into these wide open spaces, really, you know, letting our minds expand about all the possibilities ahead of us in the world and, and really shaping you know, I think our values. And it was probably between 16 and 21 with my friend 
that we kind of decided that we were going to stay friends the rest of our life, that we were going to uh, try to be successful financially, um, but without compromise to hurting the planet or any living thing, without compromising integrity. You know, we were both, you know, looking at the world of business from Utah's perspective, but you know, I went to debate when I, I debated when I was in high school. I debated the, the healthcare topic as a junior. Um, I went to Northwestern for the summer to study. Um, and the topic the second year was independence from fossil, interdependence, independence from fossil fuel. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, studying that topic at that time in my life really was, I think, combined with the immersement into nature were the two powerful aspects that mm -hmm. shaped at that time, I think, who I was supposed to be, you know. Mm -hmm. I was lucky, I think, to find, you know, my pathway, my direction, to find, um, you know, things that really mattered to me the most. And for the land to find you. You know, you mentioned the concept of interdependence mm -hmm. versus independence. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'd love to dive a little bit mm -hmm. deeper into. Um, I've been thinking about how we've worked so hard to become independent mm -hmm. as a species mm -hmm. from each other and from mm -hmm. the land, from our environments. Mm -hmm. And where that has gotten us mm -hmm. and sort of what you're creating here feels like a reclamation of interdependence. Uh, interdependence is probably one of the most important words in my vocabulary. When I was uh, in Northwestern and I was studying, the word interdependence was perplexing to me when it was in the resolution of the debate topic. And so I, I, I looked at every definition I could find for that and I realized it was kind of a, you know, kind of a made up word at the time, you know. Um, and what, what it means to me is that, you know, we strive to be, you know, um, sustainable and independent as individuals, as a family, as a community, as a nation. And yet we, with that, you know, ability to take care of our own needs, whether that is food, shelter, health care, you know, the basic needs that we all have as human beings, if we have that independence, that's great. We're not carrying a lot of baggage into our relationships, but um, recognizing that none of us do anything on our own and we can't be as good as we need to be at everything that we should be uh, good at. And so I realized that, um, you know, we need to learn how to uh, accept in a, um, in a healthy way, both parties giving and receiving, you know, um, dependencies and that a healthy exchange of dependencies on each other, which may not be necessary, but can enhance the quality of life or propel forward better ways of doing things, um, was much better done in a healthy form of exchanging dependency. Let's be the ones that we're looking for. Let's you know, really honor this beautiful planet, this mother that we all have that teaches us everything. Let's you know, be good brothers and sisters. Let's take care of um, this place. And, and really, you know, um, develop this ability to be interdependent. As I was moving through life as this young person, I was applying these kind of big universal concepts to everything. And I'm like, wow, this is working, you know? So the concepts of interdependence, finding people that really were good at certain things that were complementary to the things that I was good at, or never mind, just both being good at the same thing and sharing that experience too. But really finding how to bring people together, smaller groups, with a diverse amount of talent and shared ambitions rooted in, um, you know, in, in mindful and heartful um, uh, values and, and morals, and then to set out on a mission. So the whole economic commercial thing really was, okay, let's come up with ideas, solutions, products, services, anything that could better the planet. And let's figure out how to make money doing that without compromise to integrity. And let's share this abundance that we've worked collectively to create. And that formula really seemed to work. Yeah, so I really love that word, interdependence. Yeah, and I, 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 I like to think that most people, when they think of that word, think of it as, you know, openly, honestly, willingly sharing dependencies with each other to create a greater sum of the parts. Right. Yeah once again, becoming part of ecosystems. And mm -hmm. speaking of, I'd love to talk a little bit about both the so social and the ecological ecosystems here at 
this ranch specifically, which is Boulder Mountain Guest Ranch, and both the, the social and artistic community that you're cultivating here, as well as the ecological restoration and resiliency that you're building. Yeah, so kind of connecting, you know, um, the, the early explorations into here and the, the additional dives and connection that went on three or four times a year for the next 30 years. When I met Brandy um, in 2005, one of the things that we uh, came up with to do was to introduce each other to our favorite places in southern Utah. She took me to Goblin Valley, which I was amazed I've never been there. Um, have you been there? No, I haven't. Yeah. High Times Magazine considered it to be the most, uh, the, the, the perfect place or the best place on the planet to do psychedelics. It's God and Mother Earth pottery den. It's just full of clay sculptures and hoodoos of, you know, unimaginable, um, you know, range. So we went there, we came over here, we dropped in and did a one-nighter down into the canyon behind you. Um, she fell in love with the air. We came back and did a three-nighter um, the next weekend. And I think we had known each other maybe a month at that time. Um, and not that we hadn't already known we were gonna get married. In fact, I'd already proposed to her and I never did anything that crazy. But we knew from the first time we heard each other's voices that there was something about this connection. But so she said, when we, when we get married, well, let's get married at that ranch that we stayed at on the first night. Um, I had stayed here before, I kind of knew the owners. Um, and then a year and a half later, we got married here. It was a 500 year storm, it rained 19 inches in three days. A year and a half later, um, the owners of the property uh, had called us and said they had found a piece of property in New Mexico. They were selling this place and thought of us. So it came looking for us, keeping in mind that neither one of us had the knowledge of holistic land management at the depth that we do now. Um, so when this property came up for sale, we were so excited about the things that we could do, we dove in. But in the end, um, you know, we, we didn't know what we were really going to do. We know we were supposed to be here. And at that time, I had become friends with Daniel Pinchback. I um, was at a Sundance gathering. She said, oh, there's that author that you read his book and bought 80 copies of and sent it out to everybody that you could think of that was influential. And so I went up, talked to him, and then we hung out that year, and then we stayed in touch, and I started introducing him to our art community. And so I brought everybody down. We, Brandy had done an event in Salt Lake called Conscientia. It was post Green Man, and we, our goal was to bring together you know, 65, 70-year-old Mormon grandmothers with 18-year-old burners with mohawks and look at, an, at like an Andrew, or a Carrie Thompson piece of art and find common threads. And it was a thousand person event, a one day event with art gardens and talks. And I convinced almost everyone, all the artists to come down here to this new ranch we had just bought. And we walked to almost about where we are and we got down to the waterfall and I pulled out a bag of mushrooms, like an ounce, dosed them out to everybody and said, help us figure out why we're here. Help us figure out how to steward this land. And we went up on top of the ridge, we watched the sunset. We all got lost. We couldn't figure out how to cross this riparian zone, get back to the lights at the, at the, and we ended up in the saloon. It was all dirt and we went in there and we were all giggling and laughing. And then 45 minutes of silence later, three powerful journeys were shared. And, uh, and that was kind of the beginning of new guides coming into my life to help reveal what this land looked like before and what, you know, what our journey was about. And we continued the process of bringing writers and musicians, artists to the ranch for about three or four years. And we started going to Bioneers. Um, we started meeting the administrators there, the presenters there. We started going to permaculture um, you know, conventions like Covira in, in New Mexico. Randy took a, a permaculture certification course from Warren Brush, I believe is his name, from Ojai across the street. Um, she got psyched to do our own. We brought in two instructors. We had 50 people here for a 90 hour course. I took that course and it was really in line with all my stuff. You know, I was just getting to actually start to apply it, apply the things that I was thinking on a global scale to a local scale and realizing, and we looked at each other and we were like, we got to hire these instructors to be our consultants, to write a book. Now it is our master plan for this land, diving into all the aspects and going through that in the, in the right process. Um, and so we did it and, uh, and we created the book and uh, we haven't looked at the book much since then. Um, but when I looked at it recently with the permaculturists who just built an orchard here, 
I was like, wow, that was really more more significant, more important, you know, more of a, a compass in a in a uh, in a sign. But but the book was really about uh, and, and and what the what the what the dive into creating the book did was it defined what our mission statement was here. And what we realized what it was, it was to look globally, think globally, act locally, um, which I had been doing on a lot of, in a lot of, a lot of different aspects of life. The main concept that came through is that we as a human species exponentially doing everything, technology, population growth, you know, um, have been really destroying and damaging and breaking things, breaking our water cycles, breaking our soil cycles, you know, impacting our atmosphere, our air quality, our rain cycles, our you know, fresh water sources, our rivers, our reef systems, our oceans. We've really been doing a number. And it's overwhelming. And, and it's overwhelming for a lot of people, even a lot of brilliant people that know what's going on can't dive into the subject and stay there very long. It's too, it's too hard. You know? and, uh, and that was one thing I appreciated about Daniel Pinchback. He was drawing every bit of energy and brain power he could to really get this information out there. It's one thing that um, when I came onto this land, you know, there's so many landscapes where I'll arrive there and there's a grief because you can see what it used to be. And then you can see the sort of scars of whatever this epoch of time where, you know, humanity has, you know, humans have now become sort of the driving force of ecological function mm -hmm. in a lot of places mm -hmm. and the impact of that. And when I came here and a couple of people said, oh, you're going to the desert. And I, I looked around myself and we're sitting just above this riparian zone that, that I want to talk about. And yeah. it's like, I mean, sort of, yeah. it doesn't feel like, this is and, lush. and what it felt yeah. like was the, the active transformation of a piece of land that is the result of listening. And the result of creative expression and co-creation of humans with the land, and you can you can feel that here, and and it it's I think it goes along with the principle of emergence. Of you can feel such a strong force of emergence on this land that is so old and so ancient. At one point, you were telling me you know dinosaurs were roaming here, and it was a tropical jungle, and you know it's been desert, and it's returning to this sort of very luscious, biodiverse. Mm. And so I just want to comment on, and maybe you can respond to what it took to create mm -hmm. that feeling here when you walk mm -hmm. on the land and, and what the elements of, whether it was sort of listening and, and art mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. participate in the emergent quality of this, this ecology. People notice something's going on when they get here, but they don't notice it at the depth that you it's described that you do and, and able to articulate that. And then this idea that came through the permaculture side, owning the land and exploring what's going on in the world with some of the most compassionate, brilliant geniuses measured by their compassion, all these beautiful skills. And, but this thinking globally, acting locally, going as a human species, we are breaking things, um, you know, all these ecosystems, and a lot of us are fixing things. And that's how we're spending this time as a species, but we're not learning things enough and we're not transferring collective consciousness in a way so why aren't we doing it right you know are we being outshadowed by media and corporations and politicians and governments and where are our you know pollinators well let's think globally let's act locally you know we are individually collectively and as a species breaking things let's stop breaking things let's start fixing things then let's you know try to implement the new way and the new way was really the old way you know, just utilizing some, some technology to, you know, get us over some humps that aren't feasible now because of population sizes and such. So really this ranch then became, okay, first thing and only thing we're going to do here without compromise, you know, we're not going to do anything here with compromise to preservation. We're going to stop breaking things. So we did a deep analysis with some of the world's greatest, most brilliant minds in environmental science on what are the strengths of this land. We have water. We've got soil, it's been overgrazed, it's been compacted, but you know, there's soil here and we can rebuild soil quickly here. So we decided to preserve water, to preserve soil, to preserve wildlife habitat and the wildlife that comes with it. And then we decided that we were going to really dive deep into the world of remediation, biomimicry, restoration, um, and that's where it got super fun. Then this ranch also became a calling card because people in the know 
the water stewards of the land, the, you know, the, the soil stewards of the land, they know this is the high country, the last great step feeding the Colorado in the Grand, Grand Canyon. So anyways, I was like, okay, Brandy, let's just do that then. Let's just make sure that we preserve things. Now let's get into this preservation. So we started doing in-stream, uplands, uh, wetlands, uh, pasture work and utilizing all the new permaculture technology. Some were old adaptations into new form, uh, but we were really not wanting to make a lot of the mistakes that the early pioneers in permaculture were making. And we didn't have to, we just needed to go meet them, see their ranches, and then apply if what they were doing applied to this land in this climate or not. And the real magic though of it all was that the beavers reintroduced themselves into this riparian zone. So this is Sweetwater, it converges with Sand Creek about three miles down, and then about 12 miles further down it goes into the Escalante, which goes into Lake Powell which is the Colorado or the Grand Canyon prior to the Glen Canyon Dam. Um, and we calculated the amount of water coming through this property alone, representing two of the tributaries off the Aquarius Plateau or the Boulder Swell. Um, and, uh, and we were like, wow, we're stewarding a large amount of water here. I guess I got to learn about water rights, which is not a really simple thing. It's a very complicated issue. Has a lot of exemptions and what ifs, and this only applies if this took place. And, so we decided that we could bring education into that. We didn't have to bring a lot of people onto here to trample the ground. That was one of my first early ons was how to ingress and egress people with this property and to appreciate what's going on and to be a part of it. So the education made sense. But we, we were like, let's be really conscious how many people are here and who those people are, are and what they're here for and what the impact on us and our staff and our community is as well as the guests that are here. And uh, so we, we embarked upon the preservation, the remediation, the education, and then we realized part of all of that was food production and that we have a big broken food system on this planet. We won't get into that, but we know that it is. So bioregional food was always kind of on my radar, especially being in a protein production you know, uh, niche market. And, and in the end, between, pre between the preservation, remediation, education, food production, healthcare and the arts, we had our, we had our genre, we had our sectors, you know, now it was a matter of how far do we go in each one, at what time, what's the order, the chronological order of building this, um, let's let it go organically, let's intervene, let's, um, let's just move forward with everything we got in the most mindful and heartful way and see what happens. Meanwhile, we're doing ceremony here. We're doing some powerful work with psilocybin, sound healings, um, one particular sound healing guided by East Forest. Uh, and, you know, a number of really amazing people were here. Um, Brandy had three Native American women come to her out of the earth in a, in a truck, an old beat up truck. Mm -hmm. They put a circle around her and they said, you're finally here. It's gonna kind of make me cry. Mm -hmm. Said, you're finally here and we've been waiting for you and we're here for you and we're gonna show you what this land used to look like. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna be the one that guides everything that's going on here this transformation and that guy over there he's he's just here to help <laughs> it's really what it kind of boiled down to and uh, I got into water she got into soil mm -hmm. and trying to bring back pastures and uh, and do remediation you need water mm -hmm. you know but you've got to honor every drop you've got to create filtration you know and I learned how to key line we bought a key line plow but in any case you know it became really fun to watch the beavers doing remediation and being inspired by them and that, hey, we can do a little bit over here. What do you guys think? And they come up and work on the stuff that we had worked on. And, um, you know, and it, the traction really began. And Brandy and I both started really realizing that this work is for real. You can do in-stream stuff. You can do the upland stuff. You can do the, the wetlands creation stuff. And life comes to it. You know, we watched the beavers draw in countless ducks and geese and sandhill, you know, cranes and great blue herons and, you know, pipers and we're seeing hairier, you know, uh, hawks and never mind the red tails and, you know, goldens. And, and it just went from a dry, old, dusty land, you know, the whole riparian zone was 90 degree clay banks, flat bottom, little water moving through. I thought that's just how the desert looks. I didn't realize that that was a result of water mismanagement in the early 1900s. I'd love to continue on that thread and maybe 
give a few specific examples. You know, you were talking about the beavers and what has come back there. I'd love to also hear about what you're doing with the cattle and the grazing there. Um, and maybe some of the work over at Singing Earth, your, your sister ranch. As I mentioned, the beavers just kind of started showing up. The truth of the matter is, is they were always here. They've been always re trying to reintroduce themselves. Mm -hmm. But the ranchers and the farmers that had demonized and pesticides, turned them into pests, were killing them. How many beavers are here now? So I think we went from two, probably initially coming on when we first observed them, to 150. Um, that's my guess based upon the fact there are five major complexes on the property. These are big areas where they've got a centralized dam, pretty good sized pools, lots of little pools coming up and down, and pathways and bank lodges. And you, it takes probably 20 or 30 beater, beavers to build and maintain a complex. And can you talk a little bit, because I was just fascinated when you were talking about their process of how they build up a dam and oh, then yeah. release it and then allow the sediment and the sea. Yeah, they're flood farmers. So yeah. they flood irrigate. Uh, they're hydro engineers of epic proportions, probably the smartest, most intuitive creature on the planet. They're the only mammal and only animal designed to fell trees. Um, if they're not gnawing um, and, and dulling out, they're, they're minimizing their teeth growth, dulling them down they'll die. And the first dam we watched them build was in a pinch point, an area that's narrow. They connected that. The water that get held up in above the dam saturated the bottom of these 90 degree clay banks. They fell in on themselves and you start to see this softer angulation, this 45 degree um, uh, bank building up with all the seeds that are being brought by the new birds to the water as well as the seeds entombed in the land start generating this, you know, um, regeneration back to the you know native plants and and what blows me away is the diversity you know there's a big evasive uh, Russian olive that came into the Colorado Plateau and um, and also the tamarisk you know they were bad ideas to manage bank erosions that then took over and monocropped and shaded out so the beavers use those and so we used to have to come in and eradicate these and beavers just started taking care of that building by diversity and and so the the thing that the thing that alarmed me initially because I'm like okay these guys and then I'm learning about permaculture and then anyone in, in environmental science is you know hydro engineering they all come back to beavers because those are the masters mm -hmm. so you can't become a student and a master of environmentalism without running into the beavers and then recognizing that they are the keystone species they're they're essential and so what they do is when they build that dam and the water comes in and the seeds start getting planted is there's also silt being collected above the dam. So, you know, large runoffs, spring runoffs carry a lot of silt. And so it accumulates above the dam. And when they get enough of an accumulation, they breach their own dam so they'll notch out a hole in it, drain the water down, expose the new soil that's there that is getting mucky, you know, black and that really rich and healthy with soil microbiology. And then they let it grow up. And then once it's grown up enough, they've got a catchment system now to catch even more silt and soil. They fix the dam, build the dam up. And this is just a continuation of this process. And they build more dams and they build more check dams and they, they just keep their, their exponential. The thing that's unique about this land is that the river used to run at pasture grade through here with cottonwoods all over the place and the beavers would do what they normally do they just move water from one foothill to the next they sweep water across the land they slow it down they back it up um, they create marshes then when they move the water away those marshes dry up a bit and become beautiful pastures for grazing and, and so um, they're really creating habitat from the microbials all the way up to the big game and the birds and as we kind of come full circle here I'd love to, to zoom back out a little bit and, and um, with your time on this earth and the children and the family you've created and the community that you're building here and maybe just have you share the advice or the vision that you have for the future of what can be created here and, and maybe some of the, the principles or lessons that have helped you to get to the place that you're at. This has been my goal as it, as it evolved into the permaculture, the holistic land management, the preservation, the remediation, education, healthcare, arts, and, and, and uh, all that, was that 
okay, now I need to stay in the capital markets or let the companies, the two primary companies that, that uh, I was involved with mature. But I kind of advanced and initiated with my partners the sell-off of all our part of these entities because I felt like I was running out of time and needed that equity that we had built to really pay off the lands that I acquired. So it's this ranch, and then it was the ranch across the street because the water runs through there. Then it was the ranch up at the top of the town that was being bought out by developers. That was the first homestead, first water rights, always employed people in a cultural way, farming and ranching. And uh, then it was um, the ranch on the other side of the hill. And that was because getting the water rights for Salt Gulch in my favor allowed me to manage this more as one ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I acquired these properties for different reasons. What started to happen was me going, what am I, what am I doing? You know, am I buying these lands to sell them off um, to make more profit? And I was like, no. And I was like, well, um, how do you know that your kids or other people in our greater extended family want to do this holistic land management thing? And these are keystone properties in a little town that's being pressured by gateway development and, and subdivisions and franchise restaurants and hotels and streetlights and, and all this stuff. And most of the people here, no matter where their background is, where they're coming from, don't want that. Uh, but there's this struggle for economic sustainability as well. And so in the end, I researched out a lot of like, you know, gifting land to conservation easements and creating tax credits with that and, and creating preservation. But I realized that's good on larger tracts of land that are open land. But when you have ranches that are a key part of a community, those can get mothballed and do more damage to the land and more damage to the community if they're not the vehicle that's kept running. We started to explore how to create our own customized version of land conservation easements. Um, we came up with a structure that basically was me taking some of the equity I had in the railroad, some of the equity I had in the brine shrimp permits, in the process of selling those, gift the ownership, part of the ownership of those to a foundation. So I really sat down with everybody in the family, everybody impacted and said, are you guys okay if we never sell this land? Mm -hmm. uh, because I've come to the belief, a strong belief, that land is not to be owned and it's not to be bought and resold for a profit, at least in most cases, and at least this land particularly. On the other hand, I wanted to utilize part of the land, particularly the pasture. So on this land, for example, what we did was we took 170 acres, put 135 into the land foundation. So now it used the money generated by the gift of the equity to buy back at fair market value. And that's one of the unique things of the foundation that we created under its particular status is it can buy from me who put the money in there, mm -hmm. land that I own, provided it's done on appraisal and it's done at current market value. Um, I can also lease back the pastures for rotational grazing, for example, provided that that's done at fair market value. Mm -hmm. What I am diluting, doing is diluting myself from and my family from being the board to other people who have an interest in this land and share like-minded interests and get it. So the idea is, is that this 170 acres, bordered by Forest Service, buffered only by a mile to the National Monument, with all of this amazing water and soil and wildlife habitat, never gets developed. Mm -hmm. So even if Boulder, the town itself, gets overrun somehow by clever developers, this will remain green space. And so the idea is though, wow, did I just do something without intending it? Meaning that the 35 acres we kept, which is all the buildings and the little land around it, and the space for another winter barn and six beautiful home sites, that maybe the 35 acres we kept is worth more than the whole land was intact because there's a CCR preventing the private and the public from doing this, that, and the other thing. It's a very, very detailed document. It says you can do this, you can't do this, you can do this, you can't do this, all under the basis of we can do preservation, we can do remuneration, we can grow food, we can take care, we can do healthcare, we can do arts, we can do education, but we can't do overdevelopment and we can't, you know, and so it would take 100% of the board and the private owners, all of them, you know, and it's not just my family, I'm sharing the equity through salaries, profit sharing and ownership of who's partnering with the studio, who's partnering with the food production, who's partnering with the restaurant, who's, who's partnering with the healthcare programs. So what I'm trying to do is build in, get everyone to buy in, buy into living on the land, buy into working with the land. Um, and what I think that does through these first rights of negotiation refusal, if and when they or heirs want to sell, they're selling to a built in market of people who care or new third parties coming in who have to abide by all of these 
covenants and restrictions, you know. So I feel in some ways I've created this avenue, um, which might be the most important part of all my work mm -hmm. for people that have become entrepreneurial. Or maybe they're waking into a different state of consciousness, trying to figure out what to do with their money of how to create some tax advantages by acquiring land and then diving into the holistic management and still creating revenue streams while protecting green space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I'm really excited about that, if you couldn't tell that to me. So my job was to, to pay off the land, to build enough infrastructure, to launch a couple of things in each of these sectors, healthcare music, so that whether it's my children or friends or people who are in those spaces who really care can step into that infrastructure, step into that map, to that guidebook. Wow, what a, what a beautiful example of building intergenerational wealth and holistic Mm -hmm. holistic sense and, and, and a model for that. And I think that one thing that gets overlooked often is the business and legal frameworks of how to steward land and um, culture, agriculture, social culture. Um, and so it's a, you know, as a businessman, I think you bring that beautiful lens and, and framework to to how to cultivate some of that. Yeah. And I, I hope it serves as an example. I do, and I hope my, you know, my immediate, my biological and, 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 and non-biological children um, grow closer and closer to the, the, the whole picture or parts of the picture, um, but there's no obligation being passed through to them there. And they can sell, um, but any assets that they inherit that are part of the private side of this they sell, um, I've structured it so that money needs to go into a charity, to an organization, preferably. Um, you know, something in the areas of renewable energy or re natural building or food production or health care. Um, so they, there will be parts of their inheritance that they can use for anything they want. But when it comes to the resources from selling off these, um, this infrastructure as a business and a multiple of the business earning, yeah, it, it needs to go back into that work and, and like-minded stuff. And, and what I hope that was encouraging is don't sell. <laughs> And keep it because the thing that was funny for me growing up poor you know my parents were divorced it was my mother and i she had a struggle during that time she came out strong for me i know that it was really hard to dive into the dog eat dog rat race business world where all things are compromised for the alternative or the almighty dollar and not play it that way and still come out successful with really you know with the the, the main reason for doing that was to be a pioneer and privatize uh, specifically in the world of renewable energy. My goal from the time I was 20 and decided to be a conscious capitalist was to make enough money to start a, you know, uh, a solar farm. I want to make sure that, that my children at least um, you know, can't unravel this work. Not because it's mine, because I believe it's the, the, the right thing to do. I believe that it, it, it passes all the tests from self to community. You've shared so much beautiful wisdom and thank you for housing us in this this land. I, I can't wait to come back. Um, it's been such a such a blessing to, to be here and, and experience the merging of what you're creating, um, both in relationship to the land and arts and community. And we're gonna have a great time tonight. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm excited to celebrate with you and yeah, as we wrap up, is there anything else that you'd like to... All the kindness that you just expressed about what you think that I've played uh, or been responsible for, I've just played a, a, a part, maybe a, maybe a big part, but a part in all this. None of, none of what is here right now that we're really proud of could have happened without the environmentalists, the, you know, the health care providers, the healers, all that, you know, and, and, and uh, it's collaborative. I think that's how we're supposed to engage with each other is interdependent Inter to yeah, bring it full go. circle and um, nested, nested holes, yeah. nested mm -hmm. holes. And it feels to me like with all the grief that um, and all of the loss and all the challenges and all the struggles that we all go through at different levels in this life, there are these certain moments that when things unfold and they feel they feel perfect, they feel close to perfect. Because this is the way it's supposed to be and this is as perfect as this life is and we're all sharing that together. And, uh, and I'm just really proud that it's happening here on a place that I care about so much. Well, I think that anyone who, who comes here 
begins to get it. And so I hope that we can bring more people here and that this in some small way serves as an inspiration for more people to create their own Boulder Mountain guest ranches. And so thank you so much, Ron, for taking the time today and um, for thank sharing you, your home with us. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. If you liked what you heard, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review the show. And if you want to learn more about how to get involved with The Circle, visit us at our website or on social media. We're always looking for like-minded people to connect with.